Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. I'm Gus Dogger. I'm here with Mariana Sainko, who is the co-founder of Future Ventures, which is a venture capital firm. So uh, Mariana, welcome to the podcast. Oh, Gus, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to talk to you today. Okay, perhaps we could start by talking about how venture capital works. Where does it fit on, say, the spectrum of risk from a pension fund to a private investment? Yeah, it's it's an interesting construction in the market. And I think it's probably not the right framing to say where does it sit on on the risk, because frankly, lots of pension funds invest in lots of venture capital funds. And so um, there's a little bit of a stacked hierarchy here. I think when when people think about an investment portfolio, they think about low risk uh, and probably, frankly, low yield uh, opportunities and high, very high risk, but hopefully high yield opportunities. And venture capital is about as far on the right side of that high risk, high yield as you could probably reasonably get. Um, it's like you know maybe one tick below gambling, um, with frankly about the same statistical odds. And so, in a diversified portfolio, one might hope for uh, some small portion of the portfolio to be distributed across any one of these particular access points across this risk yield profile. And so uh, venture capital ends up being within the portfolio management scheme of many different types of investing bundles and firms. But the best way to think about venture capitalists and venture capital is that we take very high risk, hopefully high yield, for our investors' uh, chances, um, and that from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, we we are we're capable of funding things that possibly nobody else would touch with a ten foot pole. And the the flip side of that is that our cost of capital is a fair bit higher than what you might eventually come to as you come down that risk curve, right? So. Venture capital tends to make the most sense at the earliest stages of an idea to kind of test it against reality. Because there, the ret- you would expect the returns to be high if it succeeds, and you would expect a lot of things to fail at the early stage. That's right. In fact, the vast majority of things fail. And so why is this an interesting place to invest? Why, why do we need the venture capital industry? Why couldn't we just say, for example, have existing firms, existing large corporations like Apple and Microsoft do the things that venture capital uh, capitalists try to do? It's a, it's a fascinating question, right? There's been a number of books written on this construction, um, this construct of the, the innovator's dilemma, um, as it's a, a well referred to. And I think essentially there's, an, there's a set point and it's not clear to me that it's always true. It just seems to be almost always true. That at a certain size, stage, cultural po- profile of a corporation, innovation and creativity effectively falls off a cliff. And part of it is that it's hard and expensive to really throw new ideas at the wall and see what sticks. And there, for very brief periods of time, large corporations can actually occasionally pull this off and exam- wonderful examples of this are like the Bell Labs uh, situation. But they, they tend to not last very long and frankly, not that many things come out of them um, that actually push forward into reality. But Bell Labs, again, being um, a, a historical counter example. But even if we look at our friends at Alphabet, you know, Google has endeavored so many times over the years and poured so much capital into trying to build novel, beautiful hardware products. And yet we're not all walking around with Google Glass on our heads and with some type of functional robot helping us out at home. And I've wondered this myself deeply, right? Why why do you actually need constraints? to push through that that through line of of innovation and creativity. Like if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average, two thirds of companies 
on the Dow Jones Industrial Average were started in recessions, right? So perhaps that's a marker for us to think about. Perhaps what you actually need to really be pushing the bleeding edge of a particular type of innovation is to be so wildly constrained that you actually have to come up with such a novel way of doing something. Now, I'm not saying all creativity comes from startups. That's obviously not true, right? Like the wood Apple is doing incredible work on antenna design and TSMC is so good at manufacturing really incredible chips that our entire world is based off of. And as far as I can tell, no startup is like going to really, you know, figure out how to rip semiconductor manufacturing out from the big players. So there are certain things that are absolutely relegated to the world of large corporations, but there's a style and aesthetic of early stage creation, idea, product development that seems to just move much faster inside smaller, leaner companies. And why, why can't this structure of the venture capital fund or the startup be replicated inside of existing companies? I know uh, a lot of existing companies uh, have tried this, but it, to me, it doesn't seem to have succeeded wildly, at least. So why, why can't they replicate the startup environment inside of existing companies? I, I love this question. And I was at some point in my uh, prior existence at Airbus um, and before that was a, a consultant to a number of large corporations thinking about autonomous systems and robotics and, and autonomous vehicles. And I don't have a tight answer on this because like theoretically it should be possible, but I think at the end of the day, it's really hard to maintain that style of ambition and frankly delusion inside a large comfortable corporation, right? So it's, when when your lunch is beautifully served to you uh, in a stunning cafeteria with thousands of your other colleagues and everyone's kind of plugging away at a small piece of a large puzzle, it's hard to maintain a small team that actually feels existential pressure. And it's a fair question, which is like, do we actually need to feel like an existential threat, like our capacity to not exist tomorrow? to actually get through these early days inside startups. And I don't love this because as like ostensibly a person who practices like Buddhist styles of thought, I'm like, oh man, do we really have to create suffering to have output? Like that's such an unfortunate construct to believe in, right? That like, do you actually have to um, generate like fear and concern and suffering um, to get, to, to tightly iterate on products quickly, sufficiently. But I think what ends up being ha what ends up happening is that large companies have so many things that they have to worry about that setting up a cadence internally, or maybe even with some reference reference points externally that say, okay, you know, here's a bit of capital, get to these milestones. Uh, and then only then will we give you more capital for you to continue. And I think that's just hard to do with within within an employee pool. Uh, you know, it's it's frankly probably hard from an HR standpoint uh, because the, the simple reality is basically startups are on the chopping block every 12 to 18 months de deterministically trying to figure out whether or not anyone wants to continue supporting them. Yeah, we should we should dive a little deeper into this, these statistics that you've been alluding to. So when we talk about most startups failing, what does this mean? For example, if we take a, a typical VC fund, how many of their investments will succeed and to, to what extent will they, will they succeed, uh, succeed? So how many will succeed wildly? How many will totally fail? How many will become mediocre? Um, yeah. How's the landscape looking? Uh, bad. <laughs> you know, <it's> <laughs> Uh, in the in the sense that it, it's one of these, it, you're really betting on asymmetric outcomes. So there there's this construct called the the power law, which suggests that basically your your top performing investment will overshadow all other investments that you've made cumulatively, right? So 
And then if you're good, then your second best investment overshadows everything underneath that cumulatively, right? To the point where it's not that you have one winner and everything else dies, but effectively when you think about the that kind of curve, the area under the curve, right, goes down exponentially. And so you end up effectively from a perspective that the the gain you have from a small investment doing marginally okay, like maybe a 2x, is so overshadowed by a top investment doing orders of magnitude better than that, that it's all like effectively everything else could like could be a zero and it basically wouldn't matter. You know, how many venture funds are actually 10x venture funds? Frankly, not that many. How many venture funds across the pool of all venture capital firms actually have spectacular returns? Again, not that many, right? Like the top 10% of venture funds return have 90% of the gains in the market. So there's also like the small pool of players within venture capital who are doing very well. So there's almost like a power law of venture capital firms also. There are. And what's interesting about that is it's actually, there's a group called Correlation Ventures um, that has some interesting statistics on this that that actually suggests that even more so than the venture funds, it's the actual in, in individuals doing the investments. And so that even, even within venture funds, it's, it's actually like which partner you had at which firm uh, is, is probably the best correlative of overall success rather than even just the top line name brand of the firm. So, you know, when I say something like 90% of, per, of companies that one, any given venture capitalist might invest in um, are effectively but not good investments in the same way. It's not that they all go to zero. It's not that those companies die. In fact, mostly they return maybe the the original capital. So you generally try not to lose money, right? Um, but you, how many of your potential investments actually return a five or a 10 or a 20X? Uh, certainly less than 10%. And frankly, about 1%. So in a portfolio, would, in, in any given fund, we would invest in, um, 20 companies out of each novel fund that we raise, of which we would we would hope that one ideally would be an absolute moonshot outstanding winner. Uh, and then hopefully there's another one underneath that and hopefully another one underneath that. But right, it, it follows that that parallel line. Um, but our, our hope also at the same time is to ensure that every single one of our investments gets to fruition in the sense that we really we try to invest in things that we think the world fundamentally needs. And so I also care deeply about not seeing anything die just for the sake of it, um, but to actually say, can we find a soft landing spot, maybe in a large company, uh, maybe adjacent to some other organization where we ensure that this idea and this team, and this thing actually comes to fruition, uh, even if it's not right. Like, if I was just economically motivated, frankly, I should have become an investment banker. Yeah, I can I can see the attraction of venture capital investing from the investor side. But say that that, that a, a bright eyed young person comes to you and has an idea. And of course, the, you as you said, maybe they are delusionally confident in their idea. And this is I'm, I'm assuming that you would want them to, to say this is the idea that's going to change the world. If they said Looking at the statistical uh, nature of or the statistical landscape in uh, VC investing, I predict that I will probably not succeed. I mean, then you would then you would probably pass on that investment. You want everyone to believe that they are they are the ones who will su succeed wildly. Um, is there some from from the people who are starting the startups? Is there something perhaps against their own interest here that that, that the that they are expected to be to be extremely uh, perhaps overconfident in in their own vision uh, for them to be taken seriously. Well, let me let me try to better understand that question. Um, so, is the concern that they need to be overconfident to start, and that's a net negation, or that that form of personality is like a baseline requirement? Perhaps that 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 it's a baseline requirement, and could it could it be so? So could it be good for the investor, but perhaps bad for for the people trying? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> uh, whew, yeah, um, 
I think a lot of the companies that we try to invest in, right, we invest in early stage, deep technology companies that we hope will make the world a better and more verdant place and ideally more peaceful and, and more equitable and not prey on human frailty. What we find is we invest in the kinds of entrepreneurs who say, this just has to exist and it's killing me that it doesn't. And I'm looking around and nobody else is picking up this ball. So it's not that you want the reluctant entrepreneur because you actually want someone deeply motivated to go build this thing, but you want the person who is just, it's a vocation, it's a calling, it's a deep intrinsic need in their being to see this become reality. And I think when that happens, there's actually a humility that shows up. Because it's not just about them wearing a badge of like, look what a successful entrepreneur I am. And, you know, the number of people who equate success to the number of dollars they've raised, like that's that's not success. That's just your capacity to tell a very good story that's necessary, but certainly not sufficient. But there's a humility that comes with saying, I am in service to this idea. And I've willingly stepped into the ring to figure out how to make it real. And I am in service to the idea, to the other people I bring along to commit to bringing this into fruition. And so we actually find that the most incredible entrepreneurs are the ones who have a particular form of humility. They have maybe extreme technical courage, right? The capacity to say, this is really hard. Nobody has ever done this, but we have deep faith in ourselves, our team, our technical capacities, you know, our ability to build a nuclear fusion reactor. So on that aspect, they, they do have to have that perspective of a willingness to say, no, we're going to go figure out how to build reusable rockets, even though nobody's ever done it before. And at the same time, a capacity to pause and iterate and actually take real feedback um, because I think anyone who's driven to any personality poll ends up, you end up off balance and and then all sorts of probably frightening things happen personally and professionally. Yeah. So we should also perhaps say that we are talking about companies uh, succeeding or failing here. We could have repeat tries. So from the, from the person trying to start these companies, they they could start try a second time or third time. How, how common is that, that, that you see a, first time startup uh, entrepreneur fail and then come back and, and succeed? I am certain it happens with a fair bit of frequency. I think what I see more commonly is a, a startup with a moderate bit of success. Perhaps the entrepreneur personally had a life-changing financial event as a result of that. You know, what, what we would consider a moderate outcome, like, good job. You 5X this investment. Thank you for not losing our money. Thank you for making us a fair bit of capital. More importantly, thank you for bringing this idea into fruition. Um, And then maybe the company sells to some other company, that large corporation that, that hopefully continues to see the idea forward. Most often we see those entrepreneurs coming back around and saying, I've really learned my lessons. I didn't build a multi-generational, multi-billion dollar, massive organization. In fact, I got swallowed up by one of those, but now I know what, I, what I'm going to do different. I think a lot of people who struggle in their first go around absolutely do come around. I wish more of them took more time off, right? So I see a lot of people jumping from one idea to another or trying to pivot within the same company. And I think that can work, and, and obviously it has worked in in, in quite a number of cases. Uh, but I think it's also important to to pause and figure out how to reset and refresh. So I, when I do meet entrepreneurs, um, I was actually just having a dinner with um, a, a brilliant uh, former CEO who sold her company, and she she hired an executive coach after selling her company to help her ensure that she wouldn't just immediately start the next company. Which I love. 
<laughs> that is a massively motivated individual. That's the, <laughs> that's. I don't think that's a problem that a lot of people have that they can't hold themselves back. And perhaps that's exactly the type of person you're looking. But for. I think entrepreneurs do have this problem. I think like entrepreneurship is like this communicable disease, right? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> like once they get in it and and i think it's also like it's like childbirth like you you don't actually remember the pain of it you just remember the euphoria uh and and so maybe that's also some something that happens here which is that uh, people go through it and depending on their experience they don't really tap out and so they're like oh, i need more of that I would imagine that if people won moderately, so as you mentioned, maybe 5x the original investment and, and were an, now they're comfortable, I would imagine perhaps that they would become a little lazier or not be motivated to do anything. But that, that's not what you see. You, you see that they, they immediately jump to the next thing and, and try again to start something truly revolutionary. I think what happens, um, you know, ideally they take some time off and they... Um, deep time with their family and they figure out what is going to be a sustainable pace for their life. But I think when you get outside of the scope of being fiscally tethered to your reality, right, where, where a particular baseline outcome is an absolute necessity for your continued happy, healthy existence, there's a different thing that happens on the other side of that, right? When you When you're talking to a person who's who's maybe not entirely, but perhaps largely post-economic, you end up in conversations with people who are really asking, like, what needs to come into being? And how can I best position myself to be of service to that? And I find that those are some of the most fascinating people because it's, it's no longer a job, it's a calling. And I think what startups force you to recognize is that if you don't at any at any question, right, like any bright person working at any startup, frankly, at any level, like forget this, the, the founders, um, the, you know, early teams included, they, you have to ask yourself this question of it's difficult and largely thankless and the payout may never come. So you really need to be motivated by the mission of the original, of, of the thesis of the work. And if you're not, you probably shouldn't be there. And so I think that that ideology becomes even more true uh, as people move through, through their careers and, and varying stages of life. Do you think that if you had a VC fund that didn't have a high failure rate, call it failure, if 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 it does, if the startups do not succeed wildly, so so if you had a VC fund that didn't have this power law distribution, uh, would this imply to you that you weren't being ambitious enough? So would it mean that you weren't taking on very uh, weird bets um, that turn out to be great companies ten years later? Yeah, we were actually we we were just closing the fundraise on our third fund where we actually have n now closed it. Um, certainly we'll have closed it by the time this podcast goes live. And um, we had a couple folks who were talking to us who essentially said, you know, why aren't more companies in your portfolio dead? <laughs> uh, I thought you guys were, you know, on the leading and bleeding edge. And our response was, don't worry, they're still going to die. It's <laughs> um, and a lot of it was just that we we've lived um, particularly 2021 was a very strange year of a lot of capital floating around in the markets. And now that globally interest rates are on the rise, uh, things like early stage, high risk tech investing uh, probably look a little less compelling. There's probably a little less capital in the market. Um, it, more things will suffer going forward than than probably have in the last couple of years, even modulo COVID. So yeah, I, I, I fundamentally think that if you are purporting to position yourself as an early stage investor and you're not seeing some significant level of attrition, then perhaps you haven't crawled out to the furthest edge of the branch that maybe you should be. This is, in a sense, a very hardcore environment to be in. Where this is the this is the measure of whether you're succeeding is that uh, a lot of your portfolio companies are failing. That's right. Is that terrifying? 
I'm fascinated by VC. I'm fascinated by the by this kind of hit uh, based investing. Uh, another thing that's fascinating about the industry is the is the long time horizon. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about this because it it seems unique to me. Um, perhaps long time horizons like this uh, show up in academic research, but you don't see. You don't see long time horizons in publicly traded companies, at least not to the same uh, extent. I think. Perhaps tell us a bit, a bit about time horizons in in VC. Yeah, and and you know, with things like um, some folks working on the long term stock exchange, perhaps we can overall eventually shift people to a mindset of thinking over the longer arc. Um, but that's that's frankly quite difficult for people to do. Uh, it's doesn't it's not structurally set up appropriately in most of our corporations, right? We, most people take a job, particularly if you look across societal structures today. There are very few countries left on earth, like Japan, where there's an expectation of you've taken this job and you're going to work here for the next thirty years, right? Like the. It's beautiful that that continues to exist there. That is very much not the way of the broader rest of the the world or the, the direction that the world has taken. And so there's this question of saying, well, what does it look like to actually build the future world? And frankly, I think that the vast majority of people in venture capital who invest in enterprise software and consumer social media plays or whatever actually aren't operating on a particularly long horizon, right? There's there's a strong push of saying you have to get to um, profitability in two years and then hyperscale growth in a handful of years after that. Um, and the internet really under rode that trend for a long time. And then even post the dot-com crash, it's been kind of this enterprise software investing where there is a strong push to say, okay, you you don't actually have that many years to get to a, a sustainable business. The kinds of companies we invest in, we recognize that we have to be a little bit more patient, right? You You can't actually build a rocket ship that eventually becomes a Mars transporter that has a successful launch business in a short order number of years. SpaceX has been around for quite a while. And we're, as a venture fund, we're a 15-year fund, which means that um, our we hope to return capital to our investors before 15 years, but that we won't wrap up the fund short of 15 years. So that's, that's kind of the, the starting point. And the construct here is here is that to invest in these kind of Deep tech, often, you know, physical, most of our investments actually have a software underlay that allows for a computational advancement. But we recognize that these fundamental technology plays just take a bit longer to mature and that we want to be honest about what that actually looks like. That said, we actually don't think that businesses should be funded purely on venture dollars for decades on end. It's about recognizing that you have to figure out how to get to a place of iterating early with customers or the market in some way, and then re- and then over the long arc, recognizing that it can take a decade to really build that business into its full f- fruition. And that's when you as an early investor, you know, you kind of want to keep supporting and piling in. I-, I think there's a bit of a, there's a difference here, which is we don't expect liquidity in two to three years. We expect progress and growth. And that's the difference of the mindset versus, um, you know, a shareholder in the public market. That's the whole thing about public markets. They're liquid. You can actually move those positions. Private markets, you can't move those. The, the valuations are much more stable. In fact, the companies are more stable, but they're they're stable because you can't get out of them. Right? Like you're fixed. And so we, we need both, right? We need short-term liquidity and we need long-term belief systems. Is it perhaps tempting to go to these software as a service investments that can scale over the internet and return investment dollars quickly? Do do you think that's uh, it's tempting to to do that for for a lot of funds as opposed to to thinking more long term and thinking perhaps uh, creating uh, hardware? Of course, I mean that's why that's what ninety probably nine percent. I don't know. I don't actually know how many funds are 
out there right now what they're focusing on, but the vast majority of funds focus on that. And I don't blame them for a second. I just wouldn't be able to sleep at night if that's the thing that I focused on. Um, and it's not a, from a place of moral outrage of what others are doing. It's from a perspective of what is the leverage point that I would like to have on reality and what would I like to see to come into fruition? Like we're trying to fund the kinds of companies that history books will be written about. And frankly, I just don't think that many history books are going to be written about some of these very, frankly, really important, you know, underlying software systems, but helping some marketing team manage uh, their client portal is just, I mean, I'm asleep before I even manage to finish the rest of the sentence, but that, but to someone else, that's deeply exciting. Right. Uh, and so it's just about asking, like, are you at your best and highest use supporting the things that you're trying to support? How do you think about getting feedback on how the companies are doing if you're investing over very long, uh, t long time horizons? Because you, you want, I, I think uh, you mentioned earlier, you want to iterate quickly. You want to perhaps change course if what you're doing is not working. Uh, I, I don't imagine that you wait 15 years and then see how things are, are, are doing. But, but you know, how do you, how do you think about feedback over long time horizons? Oh, God, I love this question. I, this question keeps me up at night. In, in our portfolio, we try to take, take on more engineering risk and less underlying fundamental science risk, because where do you draw the arbitrary line in the sand to say that a particular piece of scientific research is now concrete and sufficient to build an entire product suite around it? We should, we should distinguish these two. So, so what's the difference between fundamental science risk and engineering risk? Is, are we talking about whether something is physically possible? Here's an example. I think we would be very reticent to invest in a novel battery chemistry without seeing an actual cylindrical cell likely on a desktop in a lab stage with a question of what is the charge? What is the discharge rate? What is the hysteresis loop? What is a full life cycle analysis of this battery, right? So basically not going to bet on someone's battery chemistry until they show me that they can manufacture at least one cell. And that probably precludes me from frankly investing in any novel battery chemistry, like as a whole, because I just have this arbitrary line in the sand of saying, I think this is the choke point and I don't know how you get past that choke point with the, you know, positive, um, w without frankly investing an, an awful lot of money. Uh, quantum computers are another perfect example. We didn't invest in any gate model computers because we basically said, oh, it's going to cost a couple hundred million dollars to build the first full gate system and any transient piece on the way to that doesn't actually say a lot about whether or not the whole gate model works. Versus we invested in a nuclear fusion company, which should probably cause you to scratch your head and say, wait a second, you not only did you do battery chemistry, but you did nuclear fusion. Like, what is wrong with you? Um, but the difference there is we really came to confidence that we invested in Commonwealth fusion systems, that a tokamak system will work. And it's a question of at what scale and how powerful a plasma and the 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 cost of the entire system and the energy output is directly related um, to the size of the plasma. And your capacity to basically have a high density plasma is driven entirely by the strength of your electromagnet. Not entirely, there's a number of other things involved, but one could make the simple correlation that if you could build a magnet that's significantly more powerful than any other electromagnet on earth, then you can have a denser plasma, higher output, smaller building, the math closes suddenly. And so when we met a company that said, we're going to eventually do this thing of building tokamaks, that's largely proven. And the thing that we need to figure out is whether or not we can first make and then second manufacture these magnets. That was an inflection point for us where we said that we can underwrite because there's a clear inflection point around which I think we, we believe that a scientifically sound set of reasoning can be built. And so that's kind of where we think is like, is there a known, testable, empirically referenceable decision point that you can come to to say this is working or not working. And 
this is where like a lot of biotech and biomedical uh, decisions are really hard because you have like these soft clinical endpoints or you have a situation where you say, okay, it didn't work inside a sample size of 10, but is that enough of an experiment to say with statistical accuracy that it's not working? Well, I don't know. Do you need to run it a hundred times, 200 times? And what is the cost of doing that? Right. So it's like always this sliding scale of saying, at which point do I gain confidence? So you're looking for a prototype or a proof of concept, something that's that's actually been built. But that's, does that in- exclude you from the very wildest and perhaps most interesting uh, investments you could make that are that are at the stage before the prototype is even created? Does it make sense to think even further out, so perhaps at a, at a 30-year timeline? Or is that simply beyond the, the capacity of, of the investment systems we have now? I don't think that there's a direct correlation between stage of technological maturity or technology readiness level or either TRL level and in a, in a linear time construction. And again, I think it's all about pricing risk to some extent. So for example, we invested in an ammonia catalysis company on the basis of belief system that we have, that the Haber-Bosch process was effectively last significantly, you know, iterated on when it was developed in the early 1900s, effectively the entirety of our global food system is based on it, right? Ammonia, the vast majority of ammonia that is generated goes into fertilizer. Turns out we need an awful lot of fertilizer. We can have a whole different conversation about whether or not that's the right way and whether or not we should be using um, uh, different agents and to, to reaffirm soil structures. But it's it's one of these it's one of these scientific technologies that that underlie our civilization where no one has even really heard about it but it it brings the food on the table every day. Correct, right? And and to any one of your listeners, highly recommend Alchemy of the Air as a book on this construct. It's it's a surprisingly engaging like beach read on and I didn't ever think I would say that about a book about ammonia, but the question of um you know, how early are we willing to go? And at what point, like this entrepreneur came to us and said, I don't have a better catalyst, but I have a strategy around using a particular form of computational modeling that I think will help us derive a pathway to creating a better catalysis process, not just for Haber-Bosch, but potentially across the entire catalysis landscape. And and I want to go explore that. And we wrote the first check into the company saying, yeah, absolutely. That is reasonable because frankly, the iteration is pretty cheap, right? It's compute cycles and fast. And then we can down select to things that we actually go and bring into like the wet lab chemistry setup. So I'm very comfortable investing at a stage that's outrageously early. If there's a commentary that suggests that the speed of experimentation is for some reason accelerated. Because the last thing that you want to do is invest on some necessary novel future innovation, but no inflection point about why you might arrive at that next inflection point faster than anyone has done it in the past or cheaper or more efficiently. Ideally, all of those things, right? Faster, cheaper, more efficiently, they all kind of stack. And so you need a you you need if you're going to be presenting something at the earliest stages of investigation, I think there also needs to be a story about why that investigation is going to be more efficient. When we talk about deep tech, I'm thinking of of nuclear fusion, for example. I'm I'm thinking of rockets, something that changes uh, something physical in the world and not just pixels on a screen. But do do you think that? Uh, a lot of deep tech involves uh, software also. So is, is, there, is there a sense in which deep tech is not, is there a sense in which hardware and software is merging together? Because as you just mentioned, the, some of these innovations that affect the physical world come out of uh, machine learning, for example. Uh, DeepMind had a breakthrough where they used, uh, again, machine learning to, to yeah, help with uh, with uh, the an advance in nuclear fusion, and so you see these two, uh, you see software and, and hardware coming together in interesting ways. Does it make sense to split the world into the physical and and software anymore? No, um, and frankly, I don't think it ever did. And 
to our friends at A16Z who, you know, at some point said software is eating the world and now are investing in an awful lot of kind of hardware deep tech companies. I, I think even the most stringent supporters of everything exists in a software layer are recognizing that at the end of the day, we're pretty three-dimensional beings that doesn't matter how compelling the metaverse becomes, we're, we're still going to move bits around and but but I also think it's an unfair delineation in the other direction, which is to say that things that exist in in free space in the atoms bits hardware world and um, that they're not entirely dependent and enmeshed in the software space, right? So this this construction of how can we use software simulation. Uh, predictive systems, transformers, large language models, whatever the the you know topic du jour is in novel software architecture and development to help our capacity to iterate faster and more efficiently in physical space. Because what we need to get away from is how slow and clunky and exceptionally costly it is to actually do things in the physical world, right? Like just, just picture this case, which is what if you could have a full biological digital twin of yourself, like you, Gus, as a human, right? With all of your ancestral familial genetic data and all of your relevant like blood levels and markers and you know food allergens like set up as but not by the creation of like creating a child and seeing what immune system they have in the world but actually saying what if we could actually recreate that digitally and then basically run models forward and backward and say well how likely are you to develop a particular type of cancer and what inputs might you want to change to shift that, right? I think the the addition of deep computational models will fundamentally shift how we move forward in the world, our capacity to have truly personalized medicine. And we're just at the most nascent stage of that today. Um, but I'm so excited basically about figuring out how these how these two spaces intermesh. Do you think that you could potentially replace the venture capital industry by huge innovation prices? So, for example, say instead of we ha instead of having venture capitalists pick out uh, startup founders that are trying to solve nuclear fusion, we put up a billion dollar prize to any team that solves nuclear fusion or that gets out net energy from from a, from a nuclear fusion process. Sure, but who funds? I mean, those exist, right? The X prizes exist, and they're not billion dollar prizes. Who who funds that fusion company getting to a prize? They're going to need a billion dollars to build their first reactor. We can change the numbers around, and we we could say perhaps it's it's actually a hundred million dollars for it uh, to make economic sense. But there is some some. Um, interesting idea in which you you incentivize people of course to try to innovate here but perhaps uh, you have a lot of different teams spending more than the total price in trying to win the price and so perhaps you 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 it's an efficient way to get what you want but is it really i mean i'm going to push you on that because one again who funds the work because it's you like let's let's use literally any industry um let's say electric vehicles, right? So someone could have funded the electric vehicle prize, but it costs an awful lot of money to go build an electric vehicle and then test vehicles and then eventually build a consumer vehicle that might get to a point of wanting to win one of those prizes. Who funds that? I don't have a great answer for that, I, I admit. So perhaps perhaps you would need venture capitalists to fund uh, a lot of firms. And, and so the, the, too, right? Because the, yeah, the yeah. prize is winning the public market. The prize yeah. is winning consumer sentiment and use case and industry and becoming the de facto standard of the future. So you don't actually need the, the, the carrot is not the question. Like the carrot already exists. The carrot is we have to figure out how to live functionally on this planet 
in concert with our ecosystems, with other humans, and then maybe eventually on other planets as well. That carrot is huge. And there's no need for a prize. The question is, and the, the other way that you could say this, like if I, t if I took your construct of a question to a lot, it's logical reality, I think you hit up against a pretty strong social fallacy, which is then there is no equitable pathway to a bright kid sitting somewhere in the world to go and start an idea because you're basically saying there's future prize, but no access to current capital. And so the only people who could actually work on those things are top universities, a handful of wealthy billionaires, people who are entirely post-economic. So we'd really be shrinking the pool set of who has the capacity to go do these things because no one's going to do work for anyone else on the promise of like, maybe one day we future win some big thing. I take your point. I totally take your point. Um, I'm so I'm interested in venture capital, and I'm interested in in which lessons we so other uh, areas of life could take from venture capital. For example, what could the philanthropy industry, if we can call it that, learn from from venture capital? Specifically, is there are there interesting lessons uh, relating to this hits based uh, investing and and long time horizons? Perhaps uh, are people not being uh, ambitious enough in philanthropy? It's an interesting question. Um, I struggle to put venture capital on a pedestal of saying that it is the best or most efficient way to bring ideas into being. It it has a particular use case and, and for things, for, for, for keys, right? Companies that fit the keyhole of venture capital, like when those two things mate, it's incredible. And everyone pats themselves on the back and the world is better, faster, hopefully, um, occasionally worse, faster. And, and then we have to deal with the fallout of that. Um, and to your earlier question, I think there will be a lot of things that will probably bear out a, a significant shakeout in the venture market. So it's not that I think that we're so intrinsically necessary that there isn't a world moving forward without us. We're just, we, we sit at an interesting inflection point. As a person who participates in philanthropy, there, there are different kinds, there are different ways to look at philanthropic gains, right? Um, and I would question whether, like where learnings from venture capital would carry over. So um, I think in terms, like an interesting question to ask is basically like, what is the most efficient spend of dollars for largest outcomes. And so turns out um, in the climate space, client earth uh, is a, is a, I believe it's a nonprofit is, is focused on helping adjudicate climate policies in the courts. So basically taking governments and corporations to task around the Paris climate accord agreements through legal battles. And so it turns out like dollars spent to outcomes had, it's like the most efficient means of getting to the desired outcome of, of people actually adhering to um, climate standards. And I love that as like a metric because I, I tend to think that things that have their own natural economic flywheel, right? And so if you as a philanthropist are saying, okay, where is my where are my dollars best spent in the climate space? Like turns out funding legal action to take corporations to task for their dirty processes. It's like one of the most efficient things you can do. And like that would be the way that a venture capitalist might think about it. But the other way that one might think about it is to say, well, where do my dollars go? They're severely today, like a space that's basically not economic and nobody in the near term can figure out how to make it economic, right? So something like, uh, there, there's a project uh, here that a dear friend of mine is, sits at the helm of, um, Ryan Felian and um, Stuart Brand at Revive and Restore, and they're trying to figure out how to basically stand up projects in, in de-extinction. So bringing back animals um, and plants and, and you know coral and the rest of it that are on the edge or just past the edge of extinction. And the vast majority of those things, now technically a startup came out of that project in an adjacency called Colossal, but, but by and large, most of these projects are like not economic in the near term. 
Um, and they maybe don't have like a global impact in the sense that like, if we bring back the black footed ferret, that's like, this, you know, it's, it's a meaningful large swath of corridor in the U S and it helps solve those ecosystems. But like, does it have its own flywheel? Is it, is, is it a global inflection point? You can make arguments in all directions. And so I think the questions to ask that a venture capitalist might ask in, in bringing to philanthropy is like, what, what can I, what, like, what is the most efficient use of dollars? Like is an interesting way to look at uh, philanthropic questions. I, I think another question is just to say the, effectively the inverse of that is to say, what is a completely non-economic thing uh, that I can do to support? The, the challenge always becomes in philanthropy that um, charities really suffer when the, the driving force behind them recedes, whether it's because a, a primary benefactor passes away and their estate doesn't continue to support it or but any number of reasons uh, can happen. And, and I think that that's, that's the thing that gives pause. And maybe that's the learning from venture capital. Cause the question that we ask essentially as investors is what is a little bit of capital that you can put in that starts a flywheel and make something self-sustaining. And that's a real question in philanthropy. Are there perhaps opportunities for bringing previously non-economic areas of, of society into making them economic? So for perhaps with a, now we were talking about de-extinction, perhaps, with, perhaps starting with philanthropy, this could become an industry. And as soon as you have something that's in the economic arena, well, then we're, we're, we're talking about a, a problem that in some sense, solves itself when you have the market working on it, you have the right incentives and so on. Is, is there an opportunity to, to kickstart uh, areas and bring them into the economic arena? Absolutely. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, our markets are based on belief systems. Our currencies are based on belief systems. Every, everything in our world is based on a, a, a societal belief system that this is worth that much and this trades for that and this supports all we, we exist in these extremely complex emergent systems. And one of the best things that you can do in, in the philanthropy space is to say, okay, what, what's, what's a belief system that probably needs to come into being that's largely unfounded today. And so they're potentially in in the climate space, for example, you know, we have the carbon credit markets and they're still absolutely nascent, but they're starting to gain steam. And man, if we could just just continue operating. Right. And a lot of what's happening there is basically philanthropic dollars going into supporting these climate organizations that are basically standing up these carbon markets and saying there's an economic flywheel to be had here. I think the next iteration of that has to be around kind of a, something like along the lines of like a diversity, like an ecological diversity credit, because uh, one could make the argument that the carbon market is the best approximation of that. But I think that there can be perhaps some perverse incentive structures by only optimizing around carbon. It, it, it's necessary and it's awesome and we should do it. And, you know, we should all be figuring out how to better fund and support carbon markets. But like my question is to say, uh, what what's the next iteration of that? How how do we support um, more soil diversity and broader eco ecological diversity? Because we know that those things carried forward actually have meaningful impacts on the world, right? But the better microbial soil diversity leads to higher crop yields that helps pollinators and insects be better supported. Uh, and then they, in turn, again, lead to better crop yields, right? So all of these systems are flywheels on one another, but we need to figure out how to add economic inflection points that help bolster those markets into being. Does philanthropy and venture capital, in a sense, blend together if we're talking about uh, solving the climate, uh, the climate issue, or at least uh, lessening uh, the impacts of climate change? Whether you approach that problem from a VC perspective of trying to fund startups, creating nuclear fusion, or whether you approach it with uh, with uh, philanthropic efforts to, in, in uh, carbon credits and so on, 
you're you're trying to solve the same problem. So, <laughs> in a sense, does it matter? Does it matter whether you you call it philanthropy or whether you whether you call it a more traditional investment? If you're trying to trying to get at the same problem, I think it does matter. I think motivations are different. You know, rightly or wrongly, there's an awful lot of people in the world right now who are very anti-capitalist systems. Um, so we should probably just be cogent around how we present ourselves and cognizant of those realities. Um, ideally, presenting both sides that there's actually a middle ground that we're all trying to streamline towards and set up, you know, less less anger and outrage towards each other. Um, but I but I actually think that there is a fundamental difference in saying, um, you know, even a 15 year fund is not an, nowhere near uh, like an infinite time horizon, right? It's 15 years, it's a minuscule drop in the bucket versus I know family offices that are thinking philanthropically that are thinking on a multi-generational scale. And that's for me a very different question. So even if they're still pretty economically minded, they have the capacity and the means uh, to think on on an orders of magnitude larger time scale. And so I, I think that it would be a shame, the same way that it's a shame if the world entirely collapses to same day trading markets. Like I think we we need every natural evolution of of pushing the framework of long-term thinking to its edges. And I think philanthropy absolutely sits a tick further on that timeline. You mentioned previously avoiding investments in technologies that prey on human frailty. What, what does this mean and why is it important? It's, inter- it's one of those really fascinating questions where, um, you know, why is it important? You could make the argument that it's not, that that every human being should learn to fend for themselves against the ails and evils potentially that technology could bring into their lives. And that's a natural form of evolution and evolutionary pressure. And, you know, we, we should stress test our societies and our governance systems and our democracies and, you know, the the strongest will win. And I think that's just an unfortunate worldview for me personally. I think that there are so many things that come into being that, frankly, it's not like I think that the social media companies had any terribly minded uh, predatory mindsets around them. I think a lot of the things that happened came from a lack of consideration of a second order effect. Uh, right? What happens when you have an infinite scroll on a screen? Well, then you just capture someone's attention possibly forever, right? And so we know that there are kind of gamified constructs that trap people. Uh, Gambling is a perfect example. Gamification of many things is a perfect example, right? It traps our attention. It feeds just enough dopamine back into us that we stay locked in these loops. And then you basically end up with a lot of people who are really suffering on the fringes of society because they don't have the resources to get out. Is there potentially a the reverse of this, so gamification for good? Absolutely. What are some interesting examples here? Have you invested in in any companies trying to do gamification for good, where perhaps you are, you know, trying to get through your to do list in the best possible way, and you get points? Oh, I don't know. Is there something like this? We, we tend to shy away from investments and in things that are direct to consumer. Um, it, it's more of a reflection of us, my, myself and Steve as individuals than because we don't believe it's a viable path forward, right? We just think that we're not the best people to think about it. But um, yeah, I met with an entrepreneur the other day uh, who is doing exactly that, who basically said, oh, what if we could... The way that Pokemon Go actually got people out, you know, through an augmented reality game on their phone, running around in the real world, turns out geotagging lots of things and generating much higher fidelity maps. Like, what if you could do that in a fun way and, and, but with the intention of getting people moving, like physically moving in space and, and getting a little bit more activity, right? So turning those same compelling video games that lock people in their rooms and getting them out into the real world and into happier and healthier bodies. 
So yeah, absolutely. I think it, it's only a failure of imagination that we frankly haven't done more of that. And you have this interesting activation barrier around individual humans, right? We're, we're like pretty reticent to get like we're, to get off the couch. We're, we're kind of energy saving devices, right? So given the option of the go forward or the stay lazy path, most people choose the stay lazy. So how do you change um, the, the decision making around that? How do you get people to eat healthier? Um, and, and I think that the, the, we can, we can do an awful lot more around this, um, the same way that when we invest in, for example, anything to do in the climate space, we basically say, we don't believe in altruism, no offense. Um, we just, you know, it's nice. Like we obviously believe in it, but uh, like on a global scale, we just think that it's an unfair request. Uh, particularly of emerging economies to say you have a lesser gain, but you have this better long-term outcome. Like, well, no one can make that. that, That's an unfair position to put somebody in, particularly when the Western world has gotten into its, you know, economic uh, fertility from a place of burning an awful lot of fossil fuels. So you have to shift the economics. You have to make the decision point today economically unquestionable. Right. So no one's ever going to pay more for the greener solution at scale. You have to pay less so that it's not actually a choice. Do you think good ideas are becoming harder to find? Are great startups becoming more rare over time? Are we Have we picked the low hanging fruit? I, I think we're barely getting started. That's <laughs> that, that's good to hear. You don't think that that perhaps it was easier to invent something um, that became a, a great company in the past, be, in perhaps in the computer industry, because there are so many, so many things that uh, that were available uh, where you could innovate, um, and but now kind of the the potential there has, has dried up, or you you see it in perhaps exactly the reverse way. I would say the I would say I see the reverse. If for no other reason than like if you track Moore's law over time, right? For the last 122 years, the amount of compute you can buy for a dollar has risen exponentially for 122 years of like just like a hundred billion billion uh, improvement over that time, which really just means that the capacity for access to do interesting things with the resources you have available. Like we've barely scratched the surface, right? Two thirds of the world's population is not actually yet connected to the internet in a coherent, consistent manner. So I, I think when you talk about that, I think anyone who's sitting from the perspective of like, oh, we're done or all of that, like that's a very kind of myopic, Western focused mindset, which is to say, we can't even begin to fathom what the rest of the world is going to offer us as opportunities. And I think that's probably coming from a lot of people from a place of like fear. But what I'm excited about is you have all of these, like all these sub-Saharan African countries who are now coming online and have mobile first economies and are starting to service their worlds. And so I think that the opportunity space is actually only growing larger, but that's because I really believe in the capacity of humans. Perhaps I should I should frame this question in another way. So think about a small team, uh, ideas that are available to small teams to to iterate on, to get better on. Uh, were those ideas easier in the past? So, for example, I'm, I'm if we look a, a long way into the past, we can we can think about. Uh, how easy it was to invent the light bulb versus how easy it would be to uh, create a quantum computer or something because because we are as a society as a civilization picking the lo- the low hanging fruit of the technological tree is it getting diffi- more difficult to find uh, interesting startups no again I, I i don't resonate with that because the the resources are becoming more prolific more equitable. And, you know, Thomas Edison and the the General Electric Company and, and you know, Nikolai Tesla concurrently in, in their own pathways, it took quite a number of thousands of years of civilization 
to get to a light bulb, right? <laughs> Let's just <laughs> so we're we're actually just on the accelerating aspect of the curve, and I I think that it's actually it, one could one could one could make the argument that it's getting easier um, because you have a larger swath of the population educated sufficiently well in the precursors such that the general level of technological literacy across society is so thoroughly expanding that you have a much wider pool set of creative individuals and teams who are chipping away at problems. Now, your question I could frame as saying, is there more noise in the system today than there was at some prior point in existence? And my intuition is to say almost certainly yes, right? Because frankly, like, who had the capacity to sit around and pontificate and be an inventor for the last couple thousand years of society, like such an outrageously small percentage of society that it's kind of laughable. So in that sense, it was probably like, maybe my job would have been easier 200 years ago because there's actually, frankly, only like 10 people I needed to talk to. Uh, but today I have to talk to thousands of people and understand what they're working on and then make some hopefully reasonably educated decision about which one of those are likely to work out. So I agree with you that from that perspective, that there's a lot more noise in the system today, but I certainly don't think that we're, we're at some creative culmination point such that the next set of interesting ideas are going to be harder to come by. I'm actually very happy to hear that from you, uh, from a person who has insight into these uh, aspects. Okay, so there's a lot of excitement about AI, about large language models, uh, generative models, all of this. Who is going to capture the value from these models? Of course, it's difficult to say, but what would be your best guess about who's, is it the hardware manufacturers? Is it the existing tech companies? Is it startups? I'm uncertain. And I try to keep my ear to the ground and, and listen to the groundswell of excitement and interest. And, you know, the simple reality is that the Microsoft open AI partnership is really sufficiently strong at this point that you go, wow, does anybody else really have access to the same capacity on the same scale? And I can look back through all time and say, man, the value accrual almost always ended up being highly condensed in a very small independent group that then ballooned, right? Um, so how does that actually work? What does that look like? Who builds these models? I think at the end of the day, there there is like different styles of value accrual in the sense that, you know, first and foremost, like the the best chip, like if you, if your audience hasn't read Chip Wars yet, highly recommend. But you know. <laughs> Turns out we've just further leaned on our needs around semiconductors and semiconductor manufacturing and having these really, really high technological capacity systems to, to build the, the highest forms of compute available and have them be freely and cheaply available. Because like, frankly, one of the, I was sitting with, a, with a, um, the top young engineering students at Stanford last night and I asked them, I, this is kind of the honors engineering students. And I asked them, who here is planning to stay in academia? Because when I was in graduate school, everyone would have raised their hand. Uh, or maybe one or two kids, you know, said, oh, I'm thinking about, and none of them raised their hands, which I thought was fascinating. And their argument was, well, really your capacity to innovate and build something interesting is directly related to your capacity to have access to compute. And like who has the most access to compute? It's actually not the universities anymore. Um, it is largely the large corporations, which is interesting and concerning, right? And even for startups, like one of the largest gating factors is basically like how many compute modules can you get a hold of? And people are like actually stockpiling chips. I'm not even kidding. It's just a really wild time right now. So I, I am worried from an access point of basically who has access to these compute models, particularly particularly in a framework where we're not we're not pushing the bounds of compute efficiency, we're pushing the bounds of like model size. 
So uh, I'm a little scared to say that I think a lot of the early value accrual will be in the large corporations, but it will eventually come down those efficiency curves. And then I think it'll get a bit more distributed. Would this then, if, if it happens so that OpenAI and, and Microsoft in, in partnership uh, captures a lot of value here, would this be an instance of an existing large corporation kind of solving this innovator's uh, dilemma or staying on top by, yeah, it, so this is, it's not, a, it's not an, uh, an acquisition, but it's a, it's a partnership of, of some sort. How does Microsoft enable and engage and pull into its own business lines some of these tools? And, and are they well suited to do so from a governance standpoint? I have no idea. I don't really know anything about the underpinnings of Microsoft corporate structure and style. But, you know, kudos to them for really making a big bet on a very, turns out, strong horse in this particular race. My sentiment here is that coming from uh, a robotics background, I think about systems that have graceful degradation and good fail-safe mechanisms. And, you know, I spent a lot of my life thinking about... um, kind of deterministic control systems. And that feels still far away from me in in these systems, in these large language models. And so I suppose I, if I listen to everyone around me, I, I could come up with the opinion saying, well, like, oh, Mariana, you're just not paying enough attention. You don't realize how fast this is getting so much better. Um, and maybe I'm a bit of a Luddite here, but I think that the initial value accrual will probably be in a lot of this like middle layer software management tools. And, you know, to anyone who's saying, you know, but these systems aren't really thinking, you could also counter with, and how often are people really thinking, right? So it's like... But I am I am very curious. I think we have no idea how to use these systems. I think they're currently very interesting, shiny baubles of toys that we're picking up and being very compelled by. But I think we we haven't even begun to understand how they will actually influence us in the long run. You think there's a role for philanthropy in perhaps subsidizing compute for traditional academic research institutes? If if you could if we could uh, have so one thing academia does well is is doing things that take it takes a long time it is it requires careful analysis and so on. Perhaps one thing that would be very interesting from a from a safety perspective uh, of these models is to know how they work. And we don't really know. Even the experts really don't know how machine learning systems uh, work right now. So perhaps there's a role for philanthropic funding of of compute for for academia. Yeah, and and one could push the universities and say, why aren't they putting more of their endowment dollars to things like this? And um, perhaps the a, a philanthropic access could be to say, you know, here are restricted funds that we will give to your universities to ask these questions. I I like that as a construct. I I think that's where the capital markets possibly fall down is if people have struggled to basically monetize philosophical and moral underpinning questions, right? To ask, okay, well, what is the right construct and how much should we trust these systems and what does it look like? And, you know, if it doesn't make any near-term economic sense to create something like an explainable AI, then who on earth is going to do it and why? And is it necessary? I think entirely relying on an economic system to say, oh, all necessary things eventually get borne out. I, I'm not sure I love that. So I, I, would, I would like to see more people asking these questions. And I mean, if nothing else, I would really love to see someone funding a bunch of um, like political philosophy and moral and ethical reasoning classes in computer science schools, because I talk to a lot of very, very bright young people. And then I just really want to hand them like a whole stack of dead philosophers to read um, because it seems that they're like 
divining some of these principles about like societal and human reasoning de novo. Um, and I kind of just want to hand them like Viktor Frankl and say like, please read this. Perhaps the, the pessimistic perspective there is that philosophers have been trying to solve the same problems for 2000 years and haven't really found any definite uh, progress. So why should we expect additional funding to help? I think they have. I mean, I, maybe I'm, I'm more philosophically optimistic on, on the value of the great thinkers of our times and how much they've influenced some of the great leaders of our times and vice versa. Like, I don't think the U.S. would exist without Jefferson and the kind of thinker that he was. So, so I, I don't concur with the sentiment that um, the support of thinking about things like symbolic reasoning and theories of mind don't lead to meaningful outcomes. It's a, it's a fascinating example you pick because the, the, talk about an impactful set of ideas uh, in the heads of the founding fathers of the U.S. that allowed basically a lot of other innovation, including technical innovation. So I, it wasn't the point wasn't to say that ideas don't have consequences in the world, but perhaps just that there are some especially philosophical problems that are so intractable that we shouldn't expect to solve them with you know even with uh, billions of dollars and and decades. Oh, I completely agree with that. But I don't think that's a reason not to keep turning those stones over. And I, I don't I don't like the line of reasoning personally to say, well, that's really hard and that's not really a knowable answer. So I'm just not going to worry about it. Right. I, I would rather have everybody be worried about it and not from generating a sentiment, an underlying sentiment of anxiety in our world. Like we have plenty of that. But to say that we are all responsible and that there there's a lot of ancient reasoning to this effect to the fact that you you are not required to complete the work nor are you free to be entirely absolved from it right that's a, a poor rephrasing of the talmud um and i i think it you could probably all stand to remember things like that how do you think about the efficient market hypothesis do you think it's true? And in, in which situations uh, is it true? I think it's largely true. Um, I don't know that it's always true. And I think it's only true in spaces where there's a good representative market. So it's hard. The, the simple reality is the vast majority of markets aren't actually free markets. They're monopolies or duopolies hiding in plain sight. And I think that in that sense, we, we rarely actually get to test the efficient market hypothesis because you don't have an even playing field of equal economically minded actors. You actually generally have power highly concentrated to a handful of individuals or organizations. And, and I think in that sentiment, it generally doesn't bear out to be that true. Fantastic. All right, Mariana, thank you for coming on the Future of Life Institute podcast. It's been a real pleasure to have you on. Oh, it's such a gift. Thank you. <laughs>